Hey, hi everyone. I'm Mike Watson here on the Acid Left channel with Douglas Kellner. Uh, he's written and published widely on the Frankfurt School and on media theory and Baudrillard. Really Since the 1980s, he actually wrote a book called Herbert Marcuse and the Crisis of Marxism was published in 84. And he's recently co-edited six volumes of Herbert Marcuse's writing um, for Routledge. So he's been working on Marcuse kind of intensely since uh, that long ago, right up to now. And he's publishing shortly a book called Technology and Democracy Towards a Critical Theory for Digital Technologies, Technopolitics and Technocapitalism with Springer in September 2021. Okay. So that's a lot of information, but Kellner is just a very good and serious and dedicated theorist of the Frankfurt School and particularly Marcuse, who we'll be focusing on today. So firstly, you have written in the past of a Marcuse renaissance, so Marcuse again becoming important. So he was, of course, very important in the 60s and 70s, I think he kind of suddenly blew up, like he wasn't as important as his fellows at the Frankfurt School, uh, such as Adorno, but he became very important for reasons you can perhaps go into. And then he's kind of fallen away. So the last few decades, Adorno has been uh, perhaps more prominent. So uh, how can you account for that? And do you think Marcuse is due a renaissance still? Uh, yes. First, let's go back to Marcuse in the 1960s and the reasons for his uh, popularity and uh, relevance to the period of the 60s, 70s, the last decades of his uh, life. Marcuse was the godfather of the new left, a major supporter of the anti-war movement, of uh, the critiques of capitalism, of imperialism. He was one of the first, certainly the first critical theorists to mediate Marxism and uh, feminism, to bring race in. Angela Davis was famously his uh, student. And Marcuse affirmed the Black Power, Black Liberation Movement. He wrote one article on the Chicano movement. So Marcuse was addressing all the uh, movements of the times, the ecology movement. Marcuse was the first critical theorist to uh, embrace this movement. So Marcuse was popular because these movements were uh, relevant. These movements were transformative. Actually, I left out uh, gay liberation. As early as 1955, Marcuse um, in Eros and Civilization talked about the liberation of Eros, polymorphic perversity. You know, he critiqued bourgeois uh, morality and uh, heterosexuality as a dominant norm. So Marcuse was just so advanced and was embraced by all these uh, movements that he uh, championed. And to make the narrative uh, short, since it's a uh, podcast, uh, in the succeeding relevance uh, decades, we had Reaganism, we had Bush, Cheney, et cetera. So we didn't really have the uh, radicalism, but this has all come back. In 2011, uh, we have liberation movements all over the world. Uh, I wrote a book called Media Spectacle and Insurrection about the uh, Arab uprisings, about the Occupy movement. Occupy is one of the big movements that uh, has embraced uh, Marcuse. Um, Obviously, the ecology movement, gay liberation, uh, Black Lives Matter has maybe been the most powerful uh, movement. So young people are going back to Marcuse because these movements are back. And they've been back now for, you know, about a decade. And Adorno famously attacked these movements. So that, in a nutshell, is Marcuse today. Okay. Um, I mean, one thing I wonder about Marcuse is just how really open was he to a kind of grassroots revolutionary movement? Is this something that more attached itself to his writing? Or was he really up for some kind of genuine overturning of the of the status quo? Yes. At the yes. time. 
Uh, and the reasons are simple. One, his students, that uh, Angela Davis, Andrew Feenberg, Ron Harrison, just a whole slew of Marcuse's students were new left uh, uh, radicals. Marcuse's third wife, Erica Sherover, is was my age uh, of you know the sixties coming to age radical uh, generation. She played the blues guitar. She you know was a radical feminist, sexual liberationist, et cetera. So Marcuse was influenced by all of these uh, people to embrace these movements, and he embraced them. I mean, I you know met Marcuse in 1969 after he gave a rousing lecture at Columbia University where I was studying philosophy at the time. Okay, I mean that's that's good to know. I mean, I wasn't really aware of that. I wondered, you know, where he he kind of found himself, you know appended to this movement and, and and whether he was kind of bemused some somewhat by that situation but maybe i've i've misread um i've misread this but um okay one of the one of the things people think of most when they think of marcuse is his kind of um link to the the protest movement of the 60s and and to the way he clashed with adorno so so, so famously theodore adorno returned to Germany after World War II, where Marcuse stayed, as they were both Germans who had fled Nazi Germany and, and then worked in America. So Adorno returned and found himself confronted by his own students who who were kind of revolting in the same vein as the protesters who, who had kind of swept throughout Europe. And so Adorno, confronted with his students, actually ended up um, famously at one point calling the police on his own students who were in occupation at Frankfurt University, but also just, you know, for a long time, a sustained period had been against the student movement, um, largely kind of based out of his university in Frankfurt. And at one point, I think Marcuse was heading back to Germany in 69. And, and after kind of prolonged uh, back and forth of letters with Adorno, when they disagreed about tactics, he said, I'd like to come and address your students. And I think Adorno was a bit upset at this prospect of Marcuse, who was very popular with the student movement in America, coming and addressing um, the students at Adorno's university. Then it never happened, of course, because Adorno uh, passed away. I think he had a, a heart attack whilst out walking. So we don't know really how that would have turned out. Um, I mean, what do you make of that now? I mean, that obviously makes Adorno look very bad. I mean, in, in his defense, he does say that, the, you know, the student movement had this kind of modicum of madness, that there's a risk that it would, it would kind of revert into totalitarianism. And I think if you look at movements now that seem to be growing up, you know, around COVID, anti-mask movements, anti-vax movements, QAnon, uh, which of course doesn't link to COVID as such, but the right wing movements that are growing up now in this very kind of unique moment do look very dangerous. So I think in that context, we could say, well, maybe Adorno's right. But I mean, is there something more to it than that for one? Because obviously there's a whole lot of stuff around that that you would need to know German and need to know maybe the text of his PhD students, what their stances were, et cetera. So can you just throw some more light on, on what really happened back then? Right. Um, Marcuse actually was as popular and influential in Germany with the new left, feminism, Marxist socialism, Marxist feminism particularly, the ecology movement, gay liberation, as in the U.S., because uh, the leaders of the German student movement were uh, Marcusians, Rudi Duchka, for instance. And Marcuse was as enthusiastic, or even maybe more so, of the German who left. And you made a point earlier that Marcuse was initially used by these movements and his popularity, and he had been basically you know, in academia for the last couple of uh, decades, but he fully embraced, I mean, he didn't uh, initiate, you know, his popularity. The students and the movements embraced him. And in Germany, he was particularly embraced as the one radical person of the Frankfurt School that was affirming this student movement. Later, by the way, Habermas was somewhat supportive of the student movement, and Marcuse and Habermas at that time were very uh, close. I interviewed both uh, Marcuse and Habermas of their you know, mutual relation. And by the way, I was in Germany 
uh, I got a German government fellowship from 69 to 71, where I studied philosophy in two meetings with Ernst Bloch, who was maybe the greatest Marxist utopian thinker of all time, that Marcuse, uh, all the Frankfurt people had great admiration for him, although they split because Bloch was to, you know, communist, to uh, ultra left. He went to uh, East uh, uh, Germany after the war, whereas all the Frankfurt people, you know, came to the U.S. But then Bloch returned to West Germany, to Tübingen, where actually Bloch was as significant for some sectors of the German uh, new left anti-war movement as Marcuse was. And the two of them were completely in sync with this utopian Marxism that embraced, you know, the whole philosophical tradition that embraced art, culture, and cultural revolution. Um, so um, again, Marcuse was the one that embraced all these movements with Bloch, and Adorno just uh, didn't. For sure, yeah, he didn't, and and then as as we discussed before, there were there were reasons for this. I, I think principally because he felt that as long as we think in the way we think, we won't kind of get past the, the tendency to dominate other human beings and and, and the tendency towards hierarchies and, and and rules. And he saw this very much as as, as kind of part of a mistaken um, enlightenment or enlightenment kind of gone wrong, but very much in line with with with, with the ways that other kind of Periods in history had tended towards um, what he would call domination, or in the English translation of his works, um, uh, you know, he talks of this identity thinking, which I've talked about uh, on various podcasts. Um, you know, the idea that we tend to identify things outside us to ward off the danger of, of essentially of nature, and as long as we do that, we're always going to be trying to control both nature and one another, and this actually results in us controlling ourselves accidentally, or you know, society ending up controlling itself through a kind of numbers game, basically capitalism. Um, so he's just he's basically saying that you know, as long as we think that way, we're not going to be able to stop this kind of process. We need to kind of think in another way, what he would call non-identity non thinking, which kind of rolls into my next point, because he said that that would be achieved through perhaps the artwork, that one can have kind of fleeting moments of non-identitarian thinking when they look at abstract work or, or more likely for him listen to abstract music or just generally, you know, music is the most abstract art form. Um, so Adorno was, was kind of saying that, but what perplexes me a little is that Marcuse, if you read his Aesthetic Dimension essay of the late 70s, he seems to go along with a very similar, he basically quotes Adorno or references him throughout the book and goes along with a very similar conception of the kind of radically abstract artwork. And I just don't see how that really fits in with his um, kind of positivity towards protest movements because one can't really incorporate abstract work of that kind into protest. And, you know, and it's not very good also for talking to the masses. So if you want to mobilize many, many people, it's no good really playing them Schomburg as Adorno, you know, liked Schomburg and Mahler, etc. So how would you see that? How did Marcuse actually see the role of the artwork being used within within protest movements? This is again an issue where Marcuse was educated by the new left, by his students, by all the people who I've uh, mentioned who had a more affirmative uh, relationship to popular culture and to art, uh, well, uh, radical art uh, movements. Now, Marcuse and Adorno shared a certain formalism, but Mar for Marcuse, the aesthetic dimension, uh, as his last book uh, indicates, was always related to the aesthetic in the sense of Schiller where it was related to play. Eros and Civilization, in 1955, he talks about the aesthetic dimension and cultural revolution. This was, again, one of the texts that was the most significant for the uh, 60s and 70s uh, movements, because this really was a radical theory of art, of uh, culture. 
And again, Marcuse was educated by Angela Davis, who also wrote a book on uh, blues later. Uh, Ricky Sherover, his third wife, who was a blues guitarist. So Marcuse had, had high art tastes of Beethoven, but Marcuse was never as abstract as Schoenberg, uh, as, uh, sorry, Adorno, who affirmed Schoenberg and, you know, the most abstract music, uh, art, uh, et cetera. For Marcuse, the artwork always had a relation to reality. It was reality for Marcuse, and, and it was the social reality of the times, including the uh, political movement. So although there was sort of a formalist mo moment that Adorno and Marcuse shared in some of Marcuse's writings on aesthetics, Marcuse grounded his uh, work in the cultural revolution of the time. You see this in a uh, essay on liberation and all of the essays and the writings on art during the 60s in his last decade of work in the 70s. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm just thinking Marcuse spoke of a kind of manufacturing of desire. Um, this is one of the things that, that kind of really led one dimensional man to really blow up when it did in the 60s. I think this kind of made him much more popular than, than he already was. Um, he talks about how we have these human desires, we have to suppress them a lot of the time. Uh, governance is a lot about suppressing people's desires, rechanneling them so they don't end up kind of protesting um, or, you know, or, or routinely trying to overthrow the, the government. Um, so we have a situation or we had in the 60s, as Marcuse describes it, where where people have their kind of desires supplanted by capitalist desires. So you're told that now you want a car, or a refrigerator, etc. Maybe certain desires of a more carnal nature are played out in films and things. So people think that they've kind of satiated desires and actually they've just kind of, you know, seen this played out by somebody else. Um, and, and this kind of leads people to, to maybe think that they've um, they somehow been satisfied, but they haven't really. So at least to kind of build up a frustration and, 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 a, and a loss of human potential. And I'm just thinking, I mean, I think there's a lot when I think of the Frankfurt School, what would they say today? Would they not just say that everything they said then is just, you know, much more the case today? Even I think, I think one of the reasons we're still looking at the Frankfurt School is that they seem to, in a sense, in a sense predicted, you know, what was to come, but they didn't really predict what to come, what was to come. They just basically, you know, told us what was happening then. And it, it so happens that everything happening then has been greatly kind of um, increased in volume. Uh so would you say that the kind of the internet, social media, memes, Instagram, internet pornography, perhaps without asking you to go you know, into any of these things in depth, but you know, are, are these things basically examples of this uh, supplanting of, uh, of desire in this way? Well, I think the continuing relevance of Marcuse and the Frankfurt School is they always operated for the dialectic of domination and liberation. So they described the major forces of domination at the time that you just uh, reiterated that continue to be um, structuring people's subjectivities, behavior, lives uh, today. But at the same time, there continue to be liberation movements against these and artworks and Actually, the, the one thing that uh, I critique on Marcuse and the Frankfurt School from the beginning, they failed, uh, they didn't develop theories of emancipatory popular culture. So Marcuse was forced into seeing how uh, certain forms of popular music and popular art uh, had an emancipatory uh, dimension. They didn't really embrace or understand these uh, movements. But the people that have followed the uh, Frankfurt School, including myself, Andrew Keenberg, I mentioned Angela Davis and Ricky Sherover, Nancy Fraser, we, we've been, uh, in, embraced 
these uh, more contemporary emancipatory forms of popular culture. But again, this is the relevance that critical theory defines or theorizes, critiques the major forces of domination uh, and the uh, looks for the forces of liberation. But to answer the, your, pre, your question simply, yes, they would agree that a lot of uh, the stuff on the internet uh, and new forms of culture you uh, mentioned are forms of domination. But I would argue there's also the possibility for liberation, you know, within podcasts, uh, within um, popular culture in general, uh, music, the internet, uh, new media, et cetera. All these can be used as forces of um, emancipation. By the way, one reason I tempered uh, my embrace of uh, new media, popular culture was Facebook and Trump and the Russians, that Facebook could really be used, you know, uh, in a pernicious fashion as a force of domination. Uh, uh, a lot of people had just become embraced in this and all the, th the things that you mentioned uh, earlier, the bad things that are going on, the anti-vax, uh, movement, Kunan, all, all of the, <clears throat> these right wing movements are also using the media. So, this is why this is my major difference from the Franker School is seeing the media, new media, contemporary popular culture as a contested domain, a contested terrain. And here I'm simply following Stuart Hall and British cultural studies. The Franker School tended towards one dimensionality for uh, technology and media. Marcuse was forced to make some concessions by his students, but didn't fully embrace it and remains a great critic of it. Yeah, um, I mean, that's very important, of course, because they are seen as elitist and, and kind of very out of touch. So, so there's some aspects of their work that map on to what's happening today and some parts don't really fit in there. But I always think that, well, they were looking at popular culture in a way that no one else was. Right. Um, so they, they kind of opened the door, right. you know, to that. And then you wonder, were they to some degree engaging with popular culture in their life? I mean, Adorno doesn't ever reference a, for example, a, a popular movie. He talks about, you know, what the movies do in his cultural industry essay, the first cultural industry essay, in the dialectic of enlightenment and you think well isn't he going to mention a specific film or or pop song or jazz song but then of course he doesn't really do that i think that's a stylistic and even theoretical consideration he doesn't want to talk about particular um examples although he occasionally mentions a, a particular example of a positive um musical or media object or you know think of um beethoven's ninth he talks about in aesthetic theory um but on the whole, I think that's some a conscious effort. I think he must have been watching, um, you know, Hollywood films also because I think he was trying to write music for Hollywood films. So they were engaging to some degree um, in these in these things. I, I think you know. I think what what you say about uh, there there being something positive about about new media new media today, I think that is hinted at by Adorno also in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, in that essay on the culture industry, he says something about the culture industry making people both more intelligent than before and more stupid than before. So there is this aspect, but I think I think is a very good way of describing things today that, I mean, I, I don't know if you teach literally now uh, what your roles are uh, in, in where you're at the university, um, but young people are just so sharp in so many ways um, today. But then they, they miss maybe some other things that we, we, we may have picked up on when we were younger in our respective you know times at, at university as students. Um, so you do get this kind of thing of, of it being the, you know, the, one of the most positive things, the way the Internet teaches, the way it's people, the way it sharpens people's maybe visual faculties. Um, but, you know, in other senses, it, it may be it makes people less critical. So we've got two things happening at once and we have to try and eke out the more positive aspects.
so going on now to there's this essay by Marcuse he wrote in 79 the reification of the proletariat where he basically says that the the, the working class has changed um, I think this is a lot of what he talks about is the fact that the working class who should be rising up are kind of co-opted by capitalism or shall we say that their the revolutionary desire is channeled into something else entirely. And today we have a situation where you can't really pinpoint a working class. Uh, people have so much stuff now in some respects that they didn't have so, so many kind of stimuli, smartphones, uh, et cetera um social media um netflix what have you so you know there are all these kind of things that that do to to some great degree um fulfill people's need to kind of like to explore to explore culture but you know at the same time you're distracting people from maybe realizing the class basis of society uh for example so I mean, this is a kind of question that puts you on the spot in a different way because I'm not really asking what Marcuse thinks. But what do you think about that? Do you think that there's any potential without kind of making you say that you're revolutionary or anything? But do you think there's any potential for kind of gathering people together under one kind of banner um, within the left? Um, I mean, how, how do we construe a revolutionary class? Who is the revolutionary class today? Okay, okay. Answer that, I just want to make the point that all of the arguments you just made and the points of the changes since uh, the Franco School was active indicates why we have to rethink, rewrite, re uh, theorize the Franco School because we're decades later and further down the line. Uh, on the other hand, the relevance today is they critique all of those tendencies that you just described that present a challenge to the uh, left, but they also embrace the social movements that we've seen since Occupy that um, oppose it. So um, as for the working class, we see, particularly in the US, we're just, just terribly divided where there's Trumpsters and anti-Trumpsters so what I see encouraging is the same thing Marcuse saw as encouraging in the 1960s was uh, the Occupy movement, the Black Lives Matter, the young people who have embraced more radical movements. Here, uh, the most exciting feature of US politics, fairly amazing in some ways, is the Bernie Sanders movement. This is a movement and Black Lives Matter. I, I've, I have some relations with both of those uh, movements, and it's pretty amazing how many uh, young people Bernie Sanders uh, turned out, and he was proclaiming socialism, uh, democratic socialism, in a very uh, forthright manner. He would start a lot of his talk, "Do you want a revolution?" And you know, the audience would of course clap. Uh, Laugh and applaud wildly, yes, yes. And Bernie would do, you know, these raps that could have been Marcuse in the uh, 1960s. Now, obviously, Sanders doesn't have Franker's school background, as far as I know. I think he's more old line uh, socialist. But uh, a lot of the young people in his movement still do read Marcuse. By the way, I sent you an email that came in just this morning, a minute or so before we were supposed to go on for the International Marcuse Society of all the conferences that we're going to have in the next uh, four years in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, in Brazil, uh, and then in the U.S. We Every two years, uh, we have a meeting. We're now going to have an international meeting every uh, year. So there's young people, and this is where my energy is still right. Uh, Bernie Sanders, to his credit, went for the working class, and he got a lot of working class uh, support. I mean, they were talking, I saw a poll of how many people were pro-socialist in Iowa, and in Marcuse's day, that would have been one or two percent, and it was something like 30, 40 percent of people in Iowa were sympathetic, and this includes to socialism, this includes working class people. So again, we're in a very bizarre historical moment and have been 
for the last decade where there's powerful right-wing uh, forces, but also uh, powerful, more progressive uh, forces. And there's been clashes uh, with, um, it's, again, this is not only on the presidential level, although it plays out to some sense in uh, elections, given that Sanders has chosen you know, to be a candidate, so that the elections bring in socialist ideas uh, and spread them in a way that you hadn't seen since the 1960s. And Marcuse basically was speaking to the new left and the student, the movements, and Sanders is speaking more to the general public, which is uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to see what, what transpires. But just along those lines, this great refusal, I mean, I don't maybe know enough about it. And certainly you've been even editing together all of Marcuse's notes and smaller texts. Um, what do you understand by this term, the great refusal? For Marcuse, the great refusal was refusing all forms of domination, of repression, of uh, imperialism, fascism, you know, oppression, uh, domination of all uh, sorts, and fighting for uh, satisfaction of human needs. Now, to return to our political discussion earlier and to make it uh, concrete, what are those needs and how should the left address them? Let me autobiographically speak about my junior year in uh, Copenhagen where I went to, this was in uh, college before you know, I went to grad school and became uh, more left wing at Columbia. Uh, but I went to uh, Denmark. I would say I was into existentialism and uh, beatnik, uh, radical uh, individualism and even libertarianism of a sort. So I go to Denmark and the first time I have a uh, flu and I go to the doctor, it's free. Okay, free healthcare. That's good. Uh, I uh, meet uh, students. Uh, my fellow students in the U.S. to this day uh, have trouble uh, paying for their education, go into debt. It's free. You have free education in uh, uh, Denmark. You have free health care, free education. I was living with a Danish uh, family that I would say was working class. And uh, the father was about 60 years old, a worker, retired. Uh, so they had great pension uh, system. So I looked at socialism in a very concrete way. Well, if they give free education, health care, welfare, uh, meet the needs of the uh, people, uh, then, you know, this is good. And I think this is uh, the way socialism has uh, translated, uh, certainly with uh, Bernie Sanders and with uh, uh, Marcuse, and uh, the movements of the uh, 1960s. It was uh, to address our needs, which by the way, today are needs to survival. I'll mention two things, one, the environmental crisis and two, the COVID pandemic. So people are seeing the ecology destroyed. Who's gonna protect the environment? Uh, the socialists have the best, well, you know, left-wing uh, ecologists environmentalists, et cetera, uh, they embrace the protection of the environment. There's powerful new movements that uh, do it. Healthcare, COVID, uh, a lot of people aren't getting vaccinated and a lot of people are anti-vaxxers because you know they're being brainwashed by the uh, media. And again, it's progressives that are speaking out and trying to address these uh, issues. So again, I see the concrete relevance of socialism today, and I see people driven towards it as they were. There were crises in the 1960s, you know, of all sorts, from the Vietnam War crisis for our generation to the environment started, you know, becoming an issue at that time. I live in Finland, actually. So I, I live in one of these Nordic countries that has a very good welfare system. So I can very much appreciate how that's better. Having come from the UK, I lived in Italy for 10 years before I moved here. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, this seems to be such a simple thing that, that can exist 
and it seems so very far off in in the US mm. and the UK. But the US is kind of it does have little moves that way. It's the UK that seems to be doomed because it's trying to move more towards the US. At least it appears that Johnson um, and the Tories are trying to sell off the NHS, whilst the US are trying to have something closer to Europe. I actually, one point on this, this struggle um, is a global one. Everywhere there's struggles between a resurgent populist authoritarian new right and um, left and oppositional uh, political uh, movement. I was a, a, fin, a Fulbright professor in uh, Finland and taught at uh, Helsinki and uh, Tampere communications in the uh, mid 1990s. So I know Finland well, which is like uh, Denmark, you know, in terms of a socialist uh, society that uh, tries and often succeeds in meeting people's basic uh, needs. But there's struggles, you know, throughout Scandinavia. There's been turns to the right, you know, in Sweden, et cetera. So again, we're in an era of global struggle between these uh, different political uh, forces. And by the way, uh, I'm coming off as pretty much of a starry-eyed uh, optimist. Uh, the dialectic of the Frankfurt School of domination and liberation is also a dialectic between pessimism and optimism. You see the worst things in the society and you know have your moments of gloom and pessimism that require an emphatic great refusal. So that's the moment of negation that Adorno also affirmed. But you have to try, and again, this is Ernst Bloch as well as the Frankfurt School, for the moments of hope for the emancipatory uh, tendencies for the new movements and to embrace and support them. So this, is, I see sort of a dialectic of pessimism and optimism, liberation and domination as the framework for the Frankfurt School it is still highly relevant today, even though the issues have evolved, they're, they're uh, congruent, continuous with a lot of the issues of the Frankfurt School, like the false needs that we talked about uh, earlier on the negative side and the new social movements on the positive uh, side. Uh, fascism, this is how critical theory uh, came into uh, being in the 1940s as an anti-fascist movement. Adorno and Marcuse were equally anti-fascist. Uh, so the Frankfurt School has always attacked uh, fascist and authoritarian movements, and Marcuse and Adorno uh, agree on this. I have one last anecdote on Marcuse and um, Adorno that may interest you. So I told you I met Marcuse in 1969 when he came to address our students at Columbia in the very uh, height of this new left revolutionary uh, mode. And we had a reception for him in the philosophy department the next day. And we asked him, uh, who should we read? You know, we're into your work in the Frankfurt School, what else? And uh, Marcuse said, well, one of the most uh, important thinkers today is Theodore W. Adorno. And I had just read Adorno's Jargon der Eigentlichkeit, Jargon der Eigentlichkeit, the critique, the jargon of authenticity, because I was doing a doctoral dissertation on Heidegger's uh, theory of authenticity. And again, to speak autobiographically for a moment, this is uh, one reason I embraced Marcuse, is because he combined the uh, positive moments in Heidegger, Sartre, existentialism that I was um, engaged in, but also was uh, critical and had uh, the critical movements. But he brought together in his early essays, existentialism, phenomenology, and Marxism. He wrote essays on a phenomenological Marxism, which was a Marxism of the present moment. that he continued, that was his model of critical theory, although he used critical theory language uh, earlier. So Marcuse was always a great synthesizer of what he saw as the most radical ideas of uh, the day.
Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it just sounds that really, nah, when you put it like that, it's, yeah, maybe it's making me think more positively temporarily. I mean, I have moments of positivity for sure. Um, and, of course, the whole thing around Sanders, that really, there, there was really a moment when it felt that like Sanders could have won won the nomination earlier on. Um, earlier on, was it last year, when they, were, when they had the... Um, how do you call this? The campaign. There's this very specific terminology in America now. I forget, but you know, you go through this process. Presidential primaries. Yes, yeah. Um, that looked positive for for a moment, and 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 things look very positive with Corbyn around 2017. Um, but then this is taken from us. But overall, yeah, I mean, I agree that there there are moments of positivity and negativity, or these two things kind of. Uh, Go, go hand in hand and circle around uh, one another. But it's just, it feels like there's like a real energy, the way you're talking about people meeting and uh, Marcuse coming and speaking to you all and you having this kind of very positive feeling about his work because he combines all these elements. It feels a bit like what's happening today. I don't know if you follow what's happening online. Um, there are many uh, podcasts on left-wing theory. There are many kind of video channels on YouTube and there are all, they, there are all these memes uh, left-wing memes um, people are making many memes about this figure Mark Fisher but also about the Frankfurt School um, of course the thing is it's online so that's something uh, different we're not getting enough like you know outside of course there's been the the lockdown but in any case I think people tend to kind of be more online uh, obviously because it didn't exist before but they, they, they tend to be more and more in the last few years online and you know, um, that in a sense fulfills people's feeling that they should be doing something. Uh, they get to talk much like we're talking now with people maybe from other countries. Um, it's very good, but then so long as it remains online, it's perhaps very safe, no? For, you know, in terms of the status quo. Well, my own uh, writings, and this is since the 1990s, you know, with the rise of the internet and uh, new media was a dialectic of inside outside that yes it's great to have uh, these podcasts my friend toby miller has uh, one you're doing uh, one and by the way i did the equivalent of this when i was at the university of texas from 1978 to 1994 before i came to ucla i had a weekly public access TV uh, show called Alternative Views. And every radical that uh, passed through Boston, we uh, interviewed from Chomsky to Herb Schiller to uh, Helen Caldicott and uh, environmentalist uh, feminists. We had uh, the local radical uh, people on from the Chicano movement, the Black uh, movement. And this show was shown all over the U.S. on public access uh, channels. So for about 15, 20 years, I was actually a bit of a media celebrity. I would go to New York and, you know, go to uh, restaurants and people come, oh, we watch Alternative Views every week. It was shown on the CUNY, the City University of New York cable channel. Uh, I uh, bought a subway token in the Bronx and the I saw and said, ah, Doug Kellner, Alternative Views. Wait a minute, he shut down this thing, came out and, you know, shook my hand, took a picture or something, and said how uh, he and his wife watched Alternative Views every day during his uh, lunch break. He, he went home, et cetera. So uh, I've always believed in alternative media, and I practiced, you know, them. I had a blog when I first came to uh, UCLA, uh, but... With the explosion of the internet, there were hundreds and thousands of people that were doing this, you know. And so I uh, went back to, uh, you know, mainly focusing on academics, my work on Marcuse, publishing these six volumes. I published a trilogy of bo uh, books attacking the Bush Cheney gang from Grand Theft 2000 about the stolen election through. Uh, media spectacle and uh, terror war uh, after um, the 9-11 uh, attacks, how 
they had the interventions the U.S. into Afghanistan and Iraq. And I published two books on Trump. So I, I put my energies more into the academic uh, uh, sphere. Uh, but I supported these, these youth movements. And I, like Marcuse, I've been excited, you know, to see them emerge since around uh, 2011. Okay, yeah, you, you have certainly done a lot of work, um, you know, around critical theory. And, and I know, and I've, I've seen your work around um, Baudrillard. Um, I mean, but Baudrillard seems an obvious kind of theorist for our times, but I suppose no more really than, than the Frankfurt School. It's just that he, he seems very appropriate in terms of talking about new media and online culture. But I wanted to ask, you know, to what degree does Baudrillard map on to Frankfurt School thought or vice versa? And a sub question of that um, will also be what what degree of cooperation was there between the Frankfurt School and the French critical theorists? Um, on the Frankfurt School and the French uh, theorists, um, this was pre-Baudrillard, so Andre Gortz, who was a colleague of uh, Sartre, uh, they had great uh, respect for Sartre himself. Uh, Marcuse, you know, was a big uh, fan of. So uh, some of the Frankfurt School people, particularly Marcuse, actually Marcuse was very much more immersed in French culture than, um, you know, Adorno or the other Frankfurt people who were, you know, pretty much specialists in uh, German uh, culture. Whereas Marcuse lectured many years in uh, France and uh, you see in Eros and Civilization, Baudelaire and, you know, the modernist uh, French uh, poets that Marcuse makes part of the aesthetic dimension and emancipatory uh, uh, popular uh, culture. So again, Marcuse of the Frankfurt School was um, the one that most embraced the uh, uh, French uh, theorists. Now, unfortunately, Habermas, who I see as a great continuer of the Frankfurt School, and I like on one hand his communication turn, since my own work had also went into media and uh, communication, but I don't like so much his critique of uh, his this negation, you know, his Adorno-esque ideology critique of the uh, French uh, theory and rejection of uh, postmodern theory, because as you pointed out, it uh, seems obviously relevant. You know, Baudrillard and Foucault, uh, Foucault perfectly matches on with the Frankfurt School with his writing on prisons, mental institutions, hospitals, in terms of very concrete descriptions of institutions of uh, domination. Baudrillard, as you mentioned, goes more into new media, simulation, hyper-reality, which again, with the new technologies of biotech, uh, as well as new social media, Baudrillard seems obviously relevant. Now, my own work has been to try to synthesize Frankfurt School with Baudrillard and New French Theory. After I studied two years in Germany in the late 60s, early 70s and appropriated critical theory, I went to France for a year and I met an Algerian philosophy student who took me to hear Baudrillard, Foucault, Deleuze, uh, Guattari. Uh, I had interviews with Levi Strauss. So I was engaged in trying to engage the French theory and the German theory and make a synthesis of it from my early work um, on. So this left, led me to a uh, interesting relationship with Baudrillard in that I um, published the first book in English on Baudrillard, uh, Jean Baudrillard from Marxism to Postmodernism and beyond. And I particularly embraced Baudrillard's earlier work. Um, which was the, to me, an updating of the critique of the media and consumer society that the uh, Frankfurt School wrote. Baudrillard's first book was on the consumer uh, society. 
the mirror of uh, production, you know, it was a very Marcusean work in some ways. But then Mark, uh, Baudrillard, starting with the mirror of production, distanced himself more and more towards uh, Marxism and became Baudrillard, you know, in terms of his middle and uh, uh, later work. So I was pretty critical of um, uh, Baudrillard. Um, but in the last couple few years of Baudrillard's work, I was more and more appreciative and came closer and closer uh, uh, to him. And that's his work on globalization, his work on terrorism, all these things that were happening in the uh, 1990s, uh, 2000s, et cetera. Uh, Baudrillard was addressing, and often in an intelligent way, and often in a way I could um, embrace myself. Uh, so I somewhat shifted on uh, Baudrillard, and I, I met him at a uh, theory, at a conference on Baudrillard. I think it was in Swansea in the UK, near the end of his life. And uh, we embraced each other and talked, had very friendly conversations. My talk was very sympathetic to Baudrillard. And this Swiss guy came up to me and said, Doc, how come you're so friendly with Baudrillard? I said, what do you mean? I, you know, I was one of the first to write on his work. I particularly more and more like some of his recent work. He said, uh, once Baudrillard told me, you know who my enemy is? It's Douglas Kellner, which was the, the most complimentary thing I ever heard about myself, that Baudrillard would actually you know, mention my name and see me as an enemy. And I said, well, you know, I was critical of a certain stage of his work, but now there's more of a rapprochement you know, with uh, Baudrillard. Um, but I mean, it must be pretty amazing to have met all these people. I mean, how did they appear? I mean, it maybe seems a slightly naive question or a funny one because it almost kind of touches upon celebrity or something. And also you, of course, were very well known. You said people were recognizing you around um, for the shows that you did. But um, I mean, were any of these people like, hey, I'm Baudrillard, I'm Marcuse, were they aware of something great? I mean, obviously they're much greater on reflection now because that's kind of how things work. Yeah, so Marcuse embraced his fame, but he used it to promote the movements that uh, he was writing about, ecology, gay, uh, sexual liberation, um, feminism, anti-war movement, critiques of capitalism and imperialism, embracing the new left and all these uh, movements. So Marcuse was using his celebrity. Now, Baudrillard, I really don't know well, but he was obviously aware that he had become a global popular, uh, et cetera, at this international Baudrillard conference there were people from all over the world. He was completely, Baudrillard was much more attuned to the media. So he knew well how popular his ideas uh, were. And I guess he used it to promote his ideas, but he, he was aware of uh, the celebrity. Foucault, as far as I could see, never went after it, but he, he also was aware of it. Okay. Um, I just I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, I, I had one more question or a couple more, but I'll ask you this, this last one. Okay. Um, so you've, compiled these six volumes called Herbert Marcuse Collected Papers from Routledge. So you must have gone through a lot there. I mean, you have, um, there's different names, there's different volumes, Technology, War on Fascism, um, The New Left, Art and Liberation, Marxism Revolution and Utopia. So you've covered basically, you know, everything he, he did. Um, what really emerged from that experience that maybe surprised you or struck you as something worthy of, of further study? Actually, it was the first volume, Technology, War, and Fascism, that's been published in you know, numerous uh, foreign languages, it just I think came out in Chinese or something. This was the big surprises that I found, which were the articles that Marcuse wrote when he was uh, in Washington with the OSS. Uh, Marcuse, Leo Lewenthal, Franz Neumann, who was Marcuse's best friend who wrote Behemoth. That was um, 
one of the great books on uh, fascism that Neumann wrote. Neumann died, Marcuse married his wife. So there was you know, a strong uh, relationship there. So this was the sort of unknown Marcuse, all the writings these guys, the Frankfurt School did on fascism during World War II for the American government, the OSS, they worked for intelligence services, which led the lunatic left to uh, label Marcuse a CIA agent, uh, you know, during the 1960s, uh, uh, because he had worked, you know, for American uh, intelligence. Now I have, I've seen not a shred of evidence that Marcuse, uh, uh, you know, had any connections with the uh, CIA, the FBI. I, I published um, a book on Marcuse's FBI file, uh, in which I got Marcuse's FBI file because I took over his uh, artifacts, and uh, Steve Gennaro and I published a whole collection of all the FBI files on Marcuse that were of essential importance for Marcuse's biography, because there were all kinds of things you didn't know, you know, about uh, uh, Marcuse. That there's no question he was not, you know, with the uh, uh, U.S. intelligence service. But anyway, the surprising things in this volume, technology, war, and fascism, were unpublished papers on technology that made Marcuse even a more radical and engaged critic of technology than uh, we previously known. And also the writings on fascism. Um, Franz Neumann publishes the behemoth, you know, it was a wildly successful and popular uh, book on um, uh, fascism. Uh, but Marcuse had some great essays like on the new German mentality where he basically uh, analyzed the culture of this authoritarian movement in ways that, you know, are relevant for the Trump era, you know, of how uh, Trump mobilized social media, Twitter most famously, uh, but also uh, Facebook, but the broadcast media, Trump uh, brilliantly uh, manipulated. Uh, and I really fault CNN and American TV networks that from every campaign, the Republican primaries with Trump and you know Jeb Bush and the others to the um, election uh, against Hil uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, basically the mainstream media uh, broadcast live every speech that Trump uh, gave, and you know this was like uh, the media under Hitler in the uh, German era. They promoted everything the uh, Nazis uh, said, and Marcuse analyzed the new German mentality as one that is susceptible to this kind of manipulation. And of course, part of the analysis was Adorno and Horkheimer on the uh, culture um, um, industry. So those, those papers on the analysis of fascism, uh, you know, I, I found to be amazingly concrete, amazingly present, precedent and still uh, relevant. We talked about the resurgence of right-wing authoritarian and populist uh, movements. And the Frankfurt School, you know, were the great theorists of that, you know, both Adorno, Marcuse, uh, Horkheimer, uh, Neumann, they really did critiques of fascism. They're really relevant today. So I guess the enduring legacy of um, Frankfurt School, uh, in terms of what we've discussed today, the tendencies of domination and uh, liberation were the critiques um, of uh, fascism and authoritarian social movements and this uh, ideology and culture and uh, mentality, as well as the forces of liberation, which Marcuse was also analyzing in his uh, OSS studies, the resistance movements in uh, Germany and elsewhere in uh, uh, Europe. So those are, those are the most interesting unknown Marcuse. That's, no, that's, that's a very good answer and loads of great information there and anec anecdotes. Um, and yeah, so we have it from Douglas Kellner that Marcuse was not with the CIA, which I guess, you know, would interest many people. 
I was wondering a bit about that, um, or at least his role in, in, in government, what that was. Great, yeah, so much to think about. Uh, please check out the work of Douglas Kellner, and he has a book on techno-capitalism out in September with Springer. So have a look at that as well, as well as his, his back catalogue. Um, so, yeah, thank you for being here. And thank you for the audience being here. And see you shortly. Thank you, Mike. If you have been enjoying our content, please consider registering your desire with the algorithm by liking and subscribing. This really does help us grow and reach a wider community. If you would like to support our work of documenting and nurturing the rise of post-capitalist desires, become a patron. This allows us to continue research-based memes, podcasts, and videos, as well as up our production value. Patrons receive early views of videos, exclusive content, and more, including physical art and the ability to directly influence our research topics. The building of a better world happens on many fronts. Turn on, tune in, and shape a future collective reality.